Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen will have more on the markets in a minute. First, the latest on the war in the Middle East. As tensions deepen between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the two leaders are scheduled to speak by phone today. Bloomberg's Amy Morris reports from Washington. President Biden issued his most forceful criticism yet of Israel's military conduct after the airstrike on a convoy of workers from World Central Kitchen, a disaster relief group founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying he was outraged and heartbroken and calling for swift investigations. The president also accusing Israel of not doing enough to protect civilians. Now, today's call will be the first between the two men since the aid workers were killed. They last spoke on March 18th. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Amy, thank you. Well, Israel's prime minister is facing more pressure from within his own war cabinet. Benny Gantz, the former military commander who now heads Israel's National Unity Party, is calling for early elections in September rather than 2026 as scheduled. Gantz's popularity has surged with Israeli voters, while Netanyahu's has dived. Now, Netanyahu's Likud party says early elections would lead to paralysis, division, and fatal damage to the chances for a hostage deal. But Gantz says it would not Israel's war effort against Hamas and would prevent a rift in the nation. Well, now, Karen, to the latest on U.S.-China relations. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is on her way to China. It'll be her second trip in nine months. Yellen spoke to reporters in Alaska before leaving. We have agreed that it's important to both of us that we don't want to uh, decouple our economies. Um, We want to continue, and we think we both benefit from trade and investment, but that it needs to be in a level playing field. And while in China, Secretary Yellen will spend two days in the southern commercial and manufacturing hub of Guangzhou before heading to Beijing for two more days of talks. We turn to the economy now. Nathan, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is reaffirming the central bank will likely lower rates this year. And we get more from Bloomberg's John Tucker. John. And Karen, Powell's comments at Stanford University helped calm any market jitters. The policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as we expect, most FOMC participants see it as likely to be appropriate to begin lowering the policy rate at some point this year. Powell said recent inflation figures, though higher than expected, did not materially change the overall picture. Investors are putting roughly even odds on an initial rate cut in June, and pricing does suggest they see a chance of fewer than three reductions this year. Next up, investors will closely watch non-farm payroll data tomorrow for further clues on the health of the U.S. economy and the likely path of monetary policy. John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. All right, John, thanks. Well, investors focused in on Jay Powell. A busy week for Fed speak continues. We'll hear from seven different Fed officials at different events today. Yesterday, Fed Governor Adriana Kugler said lower rates are likely this year. She said inflation could moderate further without significant costs to jobs or economic growth this year. Even with demand growth cooling, given the backdrop of solid supply, my baseline expectation is that further disinflation can be accomplished without a significant rise in unemployment. And Fed Governor Adriana Kugler made those comments yesterday at Washington University in St. Louis. Well, plenty of company news this morning, Nathan. ExxonMobil says first quarter earnings will likely be lower than in the prior three-month period due to falling oil and gas prices. We get details from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. In a filing, Exxon said its upstream division will take a hit of as much as $1 billion from lower oil and gas prices. Exxon is the first of the oil majors to publish earnings guidance for the first quarter. The expected drop in profit may signal a tougher earnings season ahead than the prior period when four of the five super majors comfortably beat analysts' expectations despite lower commodity prices. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg. Radio. All right, Charlie, thank you. Well, it's a big victory for Bob Iger. Walt Disney shareholders have handed the chief executive officer a big vote of confidence, rejecting dissident investor Nelson Peltz's bid for a board seat at the entertainment giant. Geetha Ranganathan covers Disney for Bloomberg Intelligence. In terms of any near-term changes, I think it's just going to be business as as usual. Obviously, he comes out victorious. I think this is uh, definitely going to supercharge him and his efforts. Um, But there is, you know, going to be continued, uh, I I think, um, watch on kind of how 
uh, Disney performs. But obviously, for, for today, I think Bob Iger is definitely very relieved. Keith Aranganathan of Bloomberg Intelligence says shareholders elected all of Disney's choices for the board. Disney is the best performing stock in the Dow Jones Industrial Average this year. It's up almost 32%. Nathan, in other media news, Bloomberg News has learned Paramount Global, the parent of CBS and MTV, is getting closer to a deal to merge with independent producer David Ellison's Skydance Media. Shares of Paramount have declined for years, reflecting the company's loss of TV viewers to other forms of entertainment and its costly efforts to develop a streaming service. Uh, We're keeping an eye on Apple, Karen. The tech giant is exploring a move into personal robotics. Sources say Apple engineers are looking for their next big thing after canceling a major electric vehicle project in February. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman broke the story. This is very nascent, very early. It would be a home robot that can follow you around. It would navigate autonomously uh, like the self-driving car Apple was working on. It would have a focus on video conferencing. Uh, And there's even been discussion internally, this is a pie-in-the-sky idea. Uh, The eventual peak of robotics could be the device being able to do the dishes, clean the dishes in your sink on your behalf. And Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says Apple's advertising for robotics-related roles on its website, indicating that it's trying to expand teams working on the project. And Nathan, we have news out of the executive suite this morning. Carlyle Group Chief Executive Harvey Schwartz was awarded a $187 million pay package in his first year at the private equity firm. The former Goldman Sachs president has been tasked with steadying Carlyle for growth and bolstering its stock price, which has lagged behind its biggest publicly traded rivals. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. We're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Rescuers are searching for survivors a day after Taiwan's strongest earthquake in a quarter century. Damaged buildings caused multiple rock slides and killed at least nine people. More than a thousand people were injured in the quake. Meanwhile, the White House says it is in touch with officials in Taiwan and are ready to help in whatever way is required. Several days of torrential rain soaked the tri-state area. Southern New Jersey residents are worried about flooding, while others just want the rain to stop. In Westville, New Jersey, construction crews worked in the mud, and one worker admits it wasn't pleasant. It's not the easiest conditions in the world, that's for sure. You know, we were working out in the rain all day, you're cold, you know, it's- chilly, muggy. Other parts of New Jersey had downed trees and power lines. New York Mayor Eric Adams and the NYPD released crime statistics for the first quarter of this year. According to Adams, there has been more than a 23% drop in overall crime in the subway system from March of 2024 to the same time last year. Adams referenced a moment earlier this week when he and officers were down in the subway system. People were walking through the gate or attempting to walk through the gate so frequently. And one guy told us, well, this transit is free. It has been free for wi- for weeks. No one was taking the initiative of saying this is the expected behavior on our system. We're now taking that initiative. Adams also highlighted the 1,000 additional uniformed officers into the subway system each day. Foreign ministers, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken, gathered in Brussels to mark 75 years of NATO. Let us together protect all we built in 75 years under NATO's shield and ensure that it remains strong to keep building for the next 75 years and well beyond that. It was founded in 1949 as collective protection against aggression from the Soviet Union. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg, Karen. All right, Michael Barr, thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Rangers and Devils at the Garden. When they met last month in Newark, there was an illegal hit by the Rangers rookie enforcer, Matt Rempe. He got suspended for it. The Devils felt they didn't have a chance for adequate revenge. So here's what took place a second after the opening faceoff. The gloves are dropped. We've got a line brawl. Jimmy Vesey and... It looks like Curtis Lazar at the center red line. Meanwhile, Rempe and McDermott drop the gloves outside the circle. Goodrow has picked up Kevin Ball. Jacob Truba has picked up Chris Tierney. And back in the Rangers zone, you've got Keandre Miller and John Marino. And ESPN Radio with the blow-by-blow. Blow. It was the scene straight out of the movie Slapshot. The main event was Rempe against the Devils. Curtis McDermott, they squared off for about 90 seconds. Ten fighting penalties, eight game misconducts. 
And then they played hockey, and the Rangers won 4-3 on a Chris Kreider goal with five minutes left. At Barclays, Nets beat the Pacers 115-111 in Boston. Celtics, 60th winner, 33-3 at home. They blew out Oklahoma City by 35. Celtics have clinched home court throughout the NBA playoffs. Yankees back in New York, home opener tomorrow. What a road trip to start the season against two quality teams, Houston and Arizona. They went 6-1. Four of the wins were nail biters. They ended the trip beating the Diamondbacks 6-5 and 11 innings. Two run homers for Aaron Judge and Alex Verdugo. First of the year for Judge, first as a Yankee for Verdugo. Mets and Tigers, another rain out. At least this time they made the call early on. Doubleheader this afternoon at City Field. And the Dodgers 5-4 win over the Giants. A long home run for Shohei Otani, his first with his new team. His old team, the Angels, won 10-2 in Miami. And the Marlins are 0-7 with all seven losses at home. Buffalo Bills have traded their four-time Pro Bowl wideout, Stefan Diggs, to Houston for a second-round draft pick next year. John Stashauer, Bloomberg Sports. Karen and Nathan. All right, John, thank you. S&P and Dow futures up a quarter percent this morning. NASDAQ futures up four-tenths of a percent. And the 10-year Treasury yield 4.35 percent. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager, waiting on what could be a tough call for President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The two leaders are set to speak by phone today, just three days after the deadly strike on World Central Kitchen Workers in Gaza that prompted some of the toughest words yet from the president over Israel's conduct of its war with Hamas. For the latest, we're joined by Bloomberg News Senior Editor Bill Ferries. Bill, good morning. We've seen this shift in rhetoric that's been building from uh, President Biden uh, really since since this war began, it almost seems like this incident that killed those seven World Central Kitchen workers has really brought things to a head. Yeah, I think it's the latest blow in a very, very strained relationship, uh, particularly between these two leaders. Uh, and, you know, we've heard for weeks uh, the White House and President Biden himself uh, calling for a different approach, uh, particularly with so many people huddled in the southern Gaza city of Rafah now. Uh, and Israel saying it will uh, continue to go forward with plans for some kind of a ground invasion. Um, and so this call today is going to be the kind of latest chapter in that uh, between in, between these two leaders. Uh, the real question is, though, uh, whether, whether the U.S. pressure uh, ends up really going beyond the public rhetoric and whether it starts to hold off on some of these kind of big ticket uh, weapons sales or weapons provisions to Israel uh, that have always kind of define the relationship. So far, the Biden administration hasn't been willing to go that far. Uh, there has been some talk around the margins about doing so, but nothing serious. And so uh, the, the latest strike has uh, drawn a lot of criticism and consternation, but it hasn't fundamentally changed uh, what's happening on the backside of the relationship. Yeah, that is the real question, isn't it, Bill? Because we have seen this sort of growing divide between the rhetoric that we're hearing from the president and the policy still continuing for U.S. support. But President Biden, as you say, is really starting to feel pressure even from within his own party. Some powerful senators saying that the U.S. should use its leverage when it comes to weapons to try to goad Israel in a different direction. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of political pressure on the president from, from both sides, really, on this now. Uh, but particularly in his party, uh, you have young voters who are really mobilized by this issue, by the war, who are uh, much more likely to uh, have some uh, sympathy for the Palestinian cause here. Uh, and many of those voters are in some key swing states that the president will have to win if he wants to uh uh, take the election in November. So uh, I think it's, you know, I, it, on the other hand, you have a you have an Israeli prime minister who hasn't shown much signs of backing down. So I don't know how you thread that needle. Uh, I don't know that these two leaders are going to have any kind of a big breakthrough today. Um, but it will be, a, a, I'm sure, a very frank conversation about their disagreements. Now, Bill, of course, you're based in Singapore, so not too far in relative terms from what's happening in Taiwan after the deadly earthquake there. Can you get us caught up on the recovery? Sure. We just had an update from the emergency personnel uh, running the rescue operations. They've raised the death uh, toll so far if, uh, from this quake uh, to 10 people. It's the worst quake that Taiwan has suffered in about 25 years. Uh, but it does seem like uh, a lot. It could have been much worse if not for a lot of building code changes and things like that that came into effect. And after that 1999 quake, there are still people stranded, uh, potentially uh, trapped. But uh, it does seem like 
uh, in terms of the human costs that uh, it's topped out so far. The economy seems to be getting back on track. You heard from uh, TSMC, one of the world's most important uh, semiconductor chip producers, that they are getting their operations back online. Uh, we do expect to hear at some point uh, an impact on terms of their deliveries and sales, uh, but that will be pretty limited given how quickly they're able to get these, uh, these factories going again. Okay, Bill, thanks for this, as always. Bill Ferries, their senior editor for Bloomberg News, joining us this morning from Singapore. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak. <laughs> 